Mark Thompson. The Mark Thompson Show. My wife wants some vegetables for a crude day. I was a basketball referee. Feels great, baby. He's Mark Thompson. It's unbelievably offensive. What he's got going here is a situation. I was fortunate. Everyone I worked with made me better at my job. You are a cover-up artist and you are a liar. Know it. It's hard to imagine a guest like the one we have coming on. And what I mean is a guy who I have such personal affections for, and you will have such great personal memories of because he's been in so many terrific projects through the years as an actor. In fact, his life crosses over the Bay Area and San Francisco in a significant way. How about it for the brilliant actor, John Shuck? Yeah, you know it. John Shuck, welcome, sir. Welcome, well, welcome. Hello there, Mark. My you buddy, know, John, my pal. <laughs> yeah. John and I have known each other for ages. Oh. Um, it's true. We met yes, at a charity event. I distinctly remember, Kim, the first time I saw Mark, I was on tour in Annie. And we were playing Buffalo, New York, my hometown. And it was the middle of winter. And uh, Channel 7 <clears throat> had their weatherman at that time stand out on a porch outside for the <laughs> 11 o'clock forecast. I love it. And this particular day, it was Mark as the weather person. <laughs> and <laughs> the snow was coming down like crazy. It is true. And by the end of this broadcast, he had white hair. <laughs> it looked like he'd grown three inches. <laughs> it was, it was a, it was a catchy idea they had, and now you see more and more stations do it. They called it the weather outside, ah. but that was the first station in America that did it. It was in Buffalo, New York, and uh, I didn't realize that you actually saw me back then. I yeah, did, was... and then when we met, you know, a gazillion years later yeah. at a, a charity event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was that... able to put two and two together because it was unforgettable. Well, and we uh, wonder why Mark doesn't do the weather anymore, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, nice well, whether he behind. does or doesn't, that, that was memorable. Uh, so, John, you yeah. know, I was mentioning that you, you know, you've done all of these things. I mean, my God, we'll, we'll get to um, the original, the original Mash movie. You know, Mash, the TV series. Uh, Kim, you may not realize that, but there was a film before it was based on a movie. Yeah, uh, the, that Altman film. Was other I born Altman, yesterday? What? I just don't know. I'd like to presume <laughs> too much. You're a young gal. Might not. Uh, anyway, the um, uh, John was in that, and I believe you met Altman uh, during during your time at ACT. Is that right? I remember something. Right. About that. Uh, he had come up to see Michael Learned, who later played Ma Walton, uh, for the part of Lieutenant Dish. And he came to see the play that I was performing in with Michael and uh, her then husband, Peter Donat, brilliant actor. And uh, it was a little a play called Little Murders by Jules Pfeiffer, a very dark comedy. And that was, I met how I met him at a, a bar afterwards. And uh, then a few years, a few days later, he called and said, uh, how'd you like to be in the movies? And he was talking about the Tommy Scarrett part in in the movie. And sure. uh, then he called again a few days later and said, they can't do that. They've got a contract player at 20th Century Fox by the name of Burt Reynolds, who they want. <laughs> well, Burt didn't get it, but Tom did. And I thought I was out of the movies as quickly as I got, as I've been offered to get in. A uh, week goes by and he calls again and said, how about the role of Painless? And I said, refresh my memory because I don't, <laughs> I don't remember that one. He did, and I said yes, and I was released from it, my it, contract by Bill Ball at ACT to do it. It was the painless role was it's big in the story. It is, but I have a little secret. The original script, which incidentally won the Academy Award that year, uh, Ring Lardner Jr.'s script was very episodic in the telling. This happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then, frankly, it was a snore. And I think I was snoring when I got to the painless part in the, in the movie. <laughs> That's why you didn't remember it. 
yeah. but but that's how it was originally assembled. And then when uh, Altman went to work and realized that the movie wasn't working, he did some clever things. He re-edited sequence. For example, after uh, Joanne Flug has been satisfied by my arousal, I played the painless pole who we won't go into what that actually was, but it, it was very pleasing to some people. And it's why you will never see a nude photo of me because I have a myth to protect. I see. Yes, yes, as to the size of my organs. I get it, John. I get it. And <laughs> anyway, you see this shot where Joanne Flug is being helicoptered out. And coming in is Sally Kellerman. Well, in reality, that incident didn't happen like that. Kellerman didn't arrive till much later in the picture. And uh, there we are. Yeah. There's John on the left. Yeah. But what a great, what a great way to come into to the Hollywood was with that picture. It so was, that began a relationship you had with Altman. You were in some subsequent films. Let me ask yeah. you about, I mean, uh, uh, you know, notable uh, Altman films. Um, I want to say... Uh, uh, Brewster McCloud and uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, right? Um, Thieves Like Us. There was a thing about Altman movies, real quick, not to get, this isn't a film class or anything, but I always wondered this. There's a lot of overlapping dialogue. It has a very uh, kind of cinema verite. You feel like you're, like almost like the actors are ad-libbing. Are right. you guys, or was it all really, it was really scripted? Yeah, well, less so uh, in MASH. Uh, there was a lot more uh, so-called improvisation by the time we got to uh, Thieves Like Us and and to some extent with uh, the Warren Beatty, Julie Christie picture. <clears throat> and, but it wasn't, it wasn't like you see in a nightclub where give me a, a name and a situation and then people start ad-libbing for five minutes and are terrific at it. We were more of a conversation. He'd say, this scene that we're doing tomorrow, what do you think about this? And why don't you just say the words for me so I can hear and he says, I don't know if that's strong enough. It wasn't. And he'd start giving ideas. And you had overnight to, to think about all this until the next day when you came to do it, it's, it had all kind of matured. And so occasionally you would deviate. And everybody was very good about picking up on that deviation. Sometimes it would lead to good things, sometimes it wouldn't. But that's how it worked. It was very, very informal. Did... Uh... Uh, yeah, there's a, there's John again. With Bob uh, Bosky and that Midler picture. Yeah. The, um, the, uh, it's interesting the world for you. And this is why I always uh, think of your career with, uh, a certain reverence, uh, the world for you was one of really being a trained actor and you were working in theater, legitimate theater. That is to say, curtain goes up, you know, Curtain goes down, eight performances a week, whatever it is, you know, right. matinees, et cetera. That's a whole different skill, that kind of acting, uh, versus a television and film where it seems you have to take the performance down. You know, it's a different kind of thing. You did it all. And uh, you went on to be doing film. We just have noted the Altman stuff and television. Uh, I, I didn't notice this the, until I was kind of reading up when I thought, well, I should look at John, some of the stuff that John has done. And you were in like in the first season of Mary Tyler Moore. You were doing TV work, episodic television. Um, did you have a, what was your feeling back then as an actor in Hollywood? Did you feel like you'd made it or do you, you do you never have that feeling? I never had that feeling. And uh, I've always had to audition. I, I can think of two or three things in my career where the part was just offered. That's, that's and, the, and the most recent of those was in a movie for Lifetime this past Christmas with Rita Moreno as my wife, um, or I as her husband, I guess is the correct word, uh, called Santa Boot Camp. <laughs> if you missed it, <clears throat> it's okay. <laughs> well, uh, let me say this. If we missed it, it'll probably be around this Christmas again. But, yeah, but most, yeah, hopefully. But most of the time, I've, I've always had to audition, which I hate because I'm terrible at it. I need process. I need, I need time to, to get to things. Tell everybody about, uh, you once mentioned to me the Woody Allen audition, which was kind of, wasn't there an odd thing about the Woody Allen audition? I barely remember it. You might not remember it either, but. Well, I, I do remember that the casting director came out and she said, 
Now, whatever you do, don't, oh, I'm going to forget what it was, but whatever it was, I did it. <laughs> and I'm glad I did because it engaged him. <laughs> but I've heard weird things about him that I, I knew one actor who was supposed to meet Woody Allen in Central Park for this audition. And uh, the guy said, I don't have a script or anything. He said, don't worry about it. Everything, it's all very informal. So he's standing at the appointed place and about 50 yards away is a tunnel. And all of a sudden out of the tunnel comes Woody Allen who just stands there for about a minute and looks at the guy and then walks back into the tunnel. <laughs> and that was it? That was it. He got a call about a half hour later from his agent saying he got the part. <laughs> wow, that is weird. I, I, my, I, I remember like an audition like that. When I, yeah, exactly. Uh, just show up at the tunnel. Uh, yeah. The, the, the thing I remember from what you had mentioned to me was they give you just one page. They didn't tell you much of anything about the character. That is, that and, is correct. Nobody in that picture, not Helen Hunt or Dan Aykroyd, uh, nobody got a uh, full script and it made it very difficult and the fact is one day I had a, about two pages of a telephone conversation and we're shooting it and when I get to the end of it thinking I'm going to hear cut and there was a long pause and then I hear Woody say okay let's go on to the next part <laughs> well I didn't have a next part but I only had the pages I was given was cut 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 and he, he said, how quickly can you learn this? Well, it was this long, you know, it was big. And I said, maybe after lunch. And um, so I, I ended up pinning the lines on the wall. Unfortunately, the camera couldn't see that. And I, I kind of oh, well, used that... it as a, as a cue card. It, and it was a very terrible way of making film. I was not. Yeah, you, well, you're such a it seems like a real process thoughtful actor that way that you like to have the dialogue on there but the i mean the mm -hmm. world of hollywood is replete with examples of people like marlon brando with you know with the script written all over the place you know <laughs> yes. the le there's legend and you can see they have pictures now of other actors in the scene with marlon brando holding cue cards on on their bodies oh, wow. uh, and it's it's wild but it worked for him and he also had an earwig etc so yeah, well thanks for mentioning me in the same breath as marlon brando there's no comparison but he, but, what was so great about Marlon Brando? His mystery. And his... He, he, he always had you on edge. It was almost like something was going to happen. Was he going to be violent? Was he going to be this? Was he going to be angry? Was he going to seduce you? I mean, he just had all this color. And uh, for someone who supposedly mumbled, had great nuance in the way he would do lines... Uh, I remember, um, Nicholson talking about the fact that, um, he was going to do the Martin Sheen role in the Godfather. I'm sorry, excuse me. He was going to oh. do the, uh, Pacino role in the Godfather, but he was told, uh, cause he wanted to be in the scene. There's a shot of you. <laughs> that looks like, uh. I don't know what that, it's a publicity photo for. Yes. Oh, so that's a publicity photo for a television show with Sharon Gless. Oh, yeah. Paul Turnabout, where yeah. I, I played the woman and she played the man. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, uh, just to round out the story, um, he, uh, turned, he turned down the role in The Godfather, Nicholson did, because he said, I, said I, I wanted to act with Marlon, but I realized I was only going to have two scenes with him. Right. And I wanted more than two scenes with him. So uh, uh, clearly, uh, the kind of reverence that the, uh, art, the, the artistic and acting community has for Brando is... Uh, you know, shared by so many. I always feel like acting is bringing a certain authenticity to a moment. You know what I mean, John? And, but it's more than just that. You're sort of suggesting, yeah, but that authenticity oftentimes has to have packed into it something. And, and that's what separated Brando, for example, in our conversation about yes, Brando. exactly. Yeah. What is that a shot from? Well, first I thought that was McCabe and Mrs. Miller, but I'm not, I, I really don't know. Kim, what is that? Can, uh, I found it on a, a list of pictures of Mr. Shuck, and I clearly a Western. That's all I can tell you. All right. Uh, yeah. well, anyway. It, it, but the, the beard and the mustache, that's the only movie that, 
And I can remember having that. Uh, I did a gun, a couple of gun smokes and a bonanza, but I don't think it's any of those. Well, in your, um, uh, you know, as your career evolved, and you did, I'll tell you another San Francisco thing that you were involved in. Uh, right? You were. I have information. I'm sorry, busting back in with it. It is John Shuck as Harvey Kid Curry Logan in Butch and Sundance, oh, the early Butch days. Butch and Sundance, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the prequel to uh, Butch and Sundance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but I was going to say, uh, uh, wasn't as good. <laughs> McMillan and Wife is what I was thinking of. Yes. Um, that, I'm sure, you know, it's shot on the Universal Backlot or wherever you shot McMillan and Wife. Well, the first couple of seasons, <clears throat> uh, we actually went up and did two weeks worth of shooting in San Francisco, which was great. But, but then we became successful on the coattails of Columbo. And after this, beginning with the third season, you never saw a car parked like this. <laughs> Out on yeah, you were part of the mystery movie uh, wheel, right? right? It was Columbo, it was McMillan and Wife. Uh, hang on, I want to try to remember this. Columbo, McMillan and Wife, wasn't there like, uh, McLeod was one of them. Dennis Weaver, right? Good. Uh, and then there was one more, though. It was like Banachek or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it kept or... changing every year. Yeah, right. It, it wasn't. Was the one, it was the one program that they couldn't quite get the uh, a yeah. hand. But McMillan and Wife was a hit. Now, Rock Hudson played the police commissioner of San Francisco, right? <laughs> Whatever that job is, he was it. <laughs> And you used to always call him commissioner. That was great. I called him commissioner. That's because uh, I didn't remember his name. But <laughs> I don't know. I was a kid, but I love that show. Now, here you are being made up for, is this Klingon makeup? Looks like no, it. No, it's another, it's another Star Trek uh, character, but uh, one of the TV uh, series. So you did a whole bunch of Star Trek stuff. Um, yeah. You... Uh, there you are. Now that's in the feature. It looks like, as I recall. That's well. One is the other is uh, another uh, Star Trek thing with what's the wonderful black actor uh, Ivory? Uh, uh, doesn't matter. It, yeah. he, he was wonderful in it, and and uh, that particular one, the one on the right there was very difficult for me. I had all the lines in, in the morning, but I had waited for 12 hours until they got to my scene. And I was tired and I was hungry. Oh. And then they complicated it by walking around this set, which was a, a, a circle. And you had to stop at a certain point. Well, it all looked the same to me at that time. So I was constantly stopping and starting in the wrong place. Oh, wow. It was a nightmare. But eventually, we pieced it together and got through it. it was that, was that was that a was that a that was a feature for one of the TV series, Star Trek? TV one of the series. TV series. I see. Yeah, yeah. The Star Trek franchise just you know blew up. Yes. Um, and you attended some of those Star Trek conventions, didn't you? I've been to uh, three or four of them over the years. And They're fun. Yeah, I would think. <laughs> and the, this, the, yeah. Yeah. the conventions like that, uh, like they do have a certain monetary reward, I suppose. And it's kind of sad in that most of us are in the later half of our career when we go to these things. But the thing I like about them is that you actually get to meet and talk with fans. And they make you realize that the work that you have done has meaning in their lives. And you've helped them. You've diverted them. You've entertained them. However uh, it has affected them, they have been affected by what you do. And that's a wonderful thing to know yeah yeah and it's interesting you know the star trek franchise birthed by the tv series of course and now with very few of those tv series actors and participants still around right uh you you have like this is the, the klingon ambassador role that you had i mean it it really ascends to an even greater profile for many of those who who really felt touched and inspired by that franchise some of them literally went into work in the sciences as a result of being exposed to star trek yeah absolutely and i've met met some of those yeah i was i went to one in england and it was held at a soccer uh, arena and we sat around you know the, the halls and it was the middle of winter thank gosh there was a uh, like a target nearby because we were able to buy out all their 
blankets and hover up. All of a sudden, I look up and I see these bare legs and kilts from the waist down and from the top up. They're Klingons. <laughs> and, and it was a group of guys from Scotland. And they awarded me the Scottish Fleet Air Marshal Award or something like that. <laughs> wow. It was a it was a hoot. That's really great. Yeah. Well, fun. you uh, you know I, I do want to also say just because I'm skipping from thing to thing and then I want to get because you're still so very active and you've just done a really important theater production and I'll get to it in a second. Yeah. But uh, the Munsters was a franchise again that was big on television the first time with was it Fred Gwynn and yeah. there are a lot of notable actors in it I guess. Uh, Fred Gwynn, uh, uh, Ivan DiCarlo played. Mm. Uh, Lily, the wife. And and then that went away, and it would, just felt as though it might have just been disposable television, but it came back in a really robust way. They brought it back as a syndicated show, and you played Herman Munster. Yeah, I did. I, I had really mixed feelings about all that because the first one was so good, and it was the right show for the right time. And it was in black and white, and it was not done as a sitcom. We were done as a three-camera sitcom after the first season, and we were in Technicolor, and with all due respect to those who writers who worked so hard on it, most of them were not up to par. And so it's a job I had really mixed feelings about. I loved doing it, and I loved the cast, but I did not like the work itself, and uh, I console myself for the fact that it got me a house. <laughs> yeah, the money, the money was okay. But hey, we did almost 100 of those. Wow, there you are. Yeah. yeah. Boy, man. you really sold it, though, huh? That's just part of the acting thing, man. No matter how you may think the script's a bit on the mediocre side, but you got to get out there and stick the landing. That's well, Yeah, you, you got to stick the bolts on, too. And okay. uh, you, that makeup was difficult. We got it down to under two hours. And fortunately, I only had to wear it twice a week, as opposed to Fred, who had to, I don't know how he did it. And by the time well, we did this, the makeups were a lot better and a lot easier on you. Let me ask you a question about money. You mentioned Fred Wynn and you, that and that show, which was the, the, the right show for, for that time. Right. Uh, tell me about, uh, by the time you got into the syndicated thing with the Munsters, uh, I'm really more curious about Gwen and people who were, you know, these are actors who get onto television. But back then, I don't think the unions had negotiated much in the way of back end compensation. I'm wondering if if those actors were well paid or were they among a group that was that had found high ground financially in television, or were, were TV actors kind of just working middle classers? Well, I don't know. I, can, I I know like Macmillan wife, nobody got rich. Well, I mean, Rock was paid the unheard salary of $60,000 an episode, but we only did six episodes or seven, maybe eight at the most. Um, I was making $3,000 a week. So I made about 30 some thousand dollars or $40,000, which was a nice salary for uh, someone, you know, Rent was cheaper in those days as, as sure. was everything else. So I had a, a nice little roof over my head, my apartment and all that. But I certainly wasn't going to get rich on it. Right. And uh, Valerie Harper's made a, a, a deal where she got paid for Rhoda, I think, $25,000 an episode. Nowadays, a young kid, seven, who's hired as the child in a sitcom like Reba or something like that, they get... Thirty, forty thousand dollars a week. They haven't done anything except learn how to tie their shoes, maybe, you know. <laughs> and so these salaries that actors are getting paid are totally different than the whole economic thing of it is different. I've always had to work for a living, and and I I did fine, but not like these people who become uh, get lucky enough to be on a hit show and then they're independently wealthy the rest of their lives. That's so true. Through. Right. They, they, I mean, once that show goes into syndication, they are, they literally never have to work again. Uh, yes. We know a bunch of people like that now. And then I do want to get to the stage work. Uh, now it's different because of streaming. The back end is sort of beginning to go away. 
and quotes are getting busted down and back ends are evaporating. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, the unions are striking, uh, writers guild and after sag, et cetera. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Um, so times are, times are changing yet again and maybe going yet forward. again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, for me, it was never about money anyway. It was about working. And, I, and as a result, I, 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 I loved work so much that I took shows that I, I shouldn't have. And uh, frankly, I took the, I took the uh, Munsters today for money. Uh, but I would never do that again because I was very unhappy for three and a half years. <laughs> right, right. It's a, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Yeah. They're kind of, uh, many of us have been in those situations with the kind of the gilded cage, you know. Yes. Um, but uh, who are the other actors who you have worked with? You worked with Reba McIntyre on Broadway, and I thought you guys were terrific together. Thank you. Uh, she's, a, she's a remarkable talent in that she can do so much. You know? Oh, she's extraordinary and has become one of our closest friends. She wasn't the reason we moved to t Tennessee, but she was part of that reason. And, then, uh, and we love it here in this part of the country. It's been, it's been great to us. I will say uh, this: yes, when you moved to when you moved to Nash, when you moved to Nashville, but when you moved to Nashville, and by the way, Reba's our best friend. It is a different kind of uh, uh, acclimatization uh, process, or whatever the word is. You know, uh, you can blend in more easily, I think, with the crowd than uh, yes. for the rest of us who are just getting dropped in the cold water of Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, no, so. I was just I was just going to say that you had asked which which, which actors. I don't I don't remember. Well, you brought up Reba, but as long as we're talking about her, she is extraordinary. But number one, she's authentic. She's authentic as a person and as a talent. Uh, she's a good comedian, and she can do drama, as she did on that series uh, this past year, up in the, with all the gory murders and this, all that that stuff. Uh, and then she's not a bad singer, you know. <laughs> And at 60 some years of age, she is singing better than she ever has in her life. It's absolutely remarkable the way she is. You know, some people call it reinventing herself, but she is sustaining herself at an extraordinarily high level in all these areas. I just think she's so versatile. I mean, you know, yes. I just call it basic versatile. I saw her live with Brooks and Dunn. And, uh, yes. Um, we're in I Vegas. Was, yeah, in Vegas, and she yeah. was terrific. We, uh, you know, great show. Uh, so, uh, but you've done a lot of Broadway. You did the, you did that with her, and I thought uh, that was great. Annie, get your gun, and uh, nice work if you can get it. it. And it's so fun to to see you on a big stage, a big Broadway stage. But regardless of your age, I mean, let's face it. I don't know how old you were when you were doing Nice Work if you can get it, but you know, uh, it's eight shows a week, right? Yeah, I was in my seventies. Yeah, and my dressing room was on the fourth floor. So that, <laughs> <laughs> the first, the first time I went to it, I, I think it took half a day. There you are, as Annie. This is yeah. you and Annie. Now, isn't that it? Oh no, this is no, my, this is oh, White this Christmas. Is a, the White Christmas, right, 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 yeah. right. This is White Christmas. This is different. This is even more recent. Um, that is uh, at the Old Globe in uh, San Diego. Um, a George Bernard Shaw play called Arms and the Man. Wow. It was a wonderful production. And uh, that's Marsha. Uh, oh, my God. Anyway. Yeah. Let me and, ask you. I, I want to go back, though, first to Annie on Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, Annie was uh, this hit that had been birthed on Broadway. Right. Um, and you came in and tell me, John, did you take on the role of Daddy Warbucks from the original cast? Yes. I replaced our, uh, not our personnel. I replaced the original Warbucks. Right. And uh, and with that is tremendous pressure, I would think. I mean, this thing was, it was a juggernaut, Annie, okay? Yeah. We now think of Annie, it's part of the culture. But at the time, that was Annie. It had just run. And now was this juggernaut on Broadway sellout. And now you're replacing the lead. I mean, aside from Annie, Warbucks yeah. is the lead. Right. And I, I, what kind of, what, did you feel pressure or were you just was it no, mixed with I excitement? I, I was so happy, ecstatic, because from the time I'd been five years old when my parents took me to see Oklahoma, 
at the St. James Theater in New York. I knew that night that I wanted to be a Broadway actor. And here we are 40 years later, and I'm finally getting that little jewel in the crown. And, and what and a I, jewel. I mean, the hottest show on Broadway. Yeah. Unreal. It, it, it was unreal. And it, uh, it was also the beginning of a lovely association with Sarah Jessica Parker, who was playing Annie at that time. Wow. And I stayed with it for a year and a half until my uh, wife got uh, pregnant with our son, Aaron Bayshuck, who uh, I hope we'll talk to all three of yeah, us. Yeah, I'll together. mention who he is. He's and, uh and I came back to Los Angeles. But one other thing happened. It was a matinee, and there's a scene at the end of the act of Act One where Annie's called down, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to ask her to if I can adopt her. And I present her with this bracelet from a Tiffany box. Lovely scene. Well. Everything was great that afternoon until all of a sudden I couldn't think of Annie's name. <laughs> and the only thought that ran through my mind was that if I looked up at the, the sign in front of the theater, I'd get the information that I needed. So I was calling her little girl, young lady. <laughs> I mean, it was a total wipeout. So I called my wife and I said, I think it's time to hang it up. <laughs> I've lost focus. I've lost focus. Oh, that's really that's a great story, bad. though. Oh, really, really great. Well, I mean, and you've just, you've had this love affair with the theater and it with you, and it continues. So um, I, I do want to, um, I, I want to mention your family in a second, because your son did something incredibly notable and continues to do a lot of stuff that, uh, is blazing trails we'll get to him in a second right. but i wanted to ask you about your most recent stage role the yes, hiding thank place you. it's yeah. a it was a fabulous play based on a book by corey ten boone called the hiding place and a wonderful writer here in uh, the nashville area uh, a.s peterson adapted it into an extraordinary play directed by matt logan and we had a very successful two, two and a half month run last summer here in Nashville. And the last week we filmed it. So we have made a movie of a stage play and it's obvious you can see microphones and, and our heads and stuff like that from time to time. But the play is now available to be seen. And it is going to be seen in movie theaters throughout the world. Wow. Um, August the 3rd and 5th. I think it's the 3rd in Los Angeles. Maybe it's both those dates. And then worldwide later in the month on the 16th, August 16th. They've done this with things like operas sure. where you, you buy tickets and there's only a few screenings. Um, it, but it's a wonderful way to see things that you might not or ordinarily see. I'm really proud of this, uh, not only of my work, but of the entire production. It's very moving, uh, but more importantly, it's inspiring uh, and, and lets one see once again what the human spirit can do. Well, what's it about, John? If you, you, what's well, it about? the 10 booms lived in the Netherlands and the father, Casper, who I played, was a clockmaker, and uh, they had what they call a bayet, a little shop in the house. And it's right at the time that Nazi Germany was rising to its fullest and invaded Holland. And ultimately what happens is they hid Jews, they were not Jewish, they hid Jews in their walls of their home. It was very cleverly built out as a hiding place, and they were behind it. And they saved several hundred Jews during the course of the war until they were discovered. And none of them made it out of the camps except Corey, who devoted her life to preaching the gospel of forgiveness, love, and repentance. And uh, that's what this play is about. It's very, I, and this very is, moving. 
And so this is a this is a true story. It's based it's on a, a true story. A, wow. And anybody wow. who hasn't read it doesn't have a chance to go to the movie. I highly recommend the book, which you can still get. Uh, it's called The Hiding Place, and it's by Corey C O R R I E, ten T E N, Boom B O O M. Wow, great stuff. I know it got remarkable write-ups. I mean, just uh, like transcendental write-ups. Yeah. And uh, congratulations on that. Thank so you. I want to ask you about uh, your son because your son did something. I mean, I'm sure he's done a bunch of stuff, but I'll just give you like one of the marquee things. Your son discovered Bruno Mars. Okay. That is... I. <laughs> I, if you stopped right there, you could plant the flag. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but he has gone on to uh, nurture a bunch of huge careers, uh, produce, and he's co-written on a bunch of, you know, Flo Rida stuff. And, um, right. you know, I mean, I think, again, I he's the real music guy. I kind of am a retail music consumer, you know, just on the radio and et cetera. But your son, Aaron Bay Shuck, is, uh, is an amazing story because he started as just an A&R guy. I remember when he was just a kid, like, trying to discover a hip-hop band or something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, when he was in college, he, he, I kept asking him, do you know what you might like to do? And finally, he said, well, the only thing I really like is music. And I said, well, let's begin there. And so he got apprenticeships and stuff. And then when he got out of college, he got some more apprenticeships. Uh, at various places, and ultimately, he ended up through a series of events and some luck on his side, with Lord willing, to uh, to be president and CEO of Warner Music. So <laughs> That's it's, it's a quite, quite an accomplishment. It doesn't yeah. doesn't happen. There's a, there he is. There he is, the handsome devil. He's yeah. a new dad. Thanks, yeah. Ken. And uh, hi, Aaron. So it's it's wonderful. But his best achievement has been presenting us with a grandson. Leo, uh, who will be a year next month. Yeah, there you go. That's the yeah. real thing. Yeah. Uh, adorable kid. I mean, I know that it's tough to miss adorability as a child, but that kid is really... There's the hiding place. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, thank yeah, you. the yeah, people who are, are interested in, in, in tickets, uh, they can go to the Hiding Place Films, the Hiding Place Films, all lowercase, dot com, and uh, that'll let you know what theater is in your town and the date and the price. That's terrific. One stop there shopping. You there you go. Uh, so, look, I'd love to visit with you again. This has been a fun visit. I, believe it or not, we could ask you about any number of things. I tried to skip around and get into a, you know, a couple of conversations about uh, stuff. But I, I, I adore talking to you, and so I could do it. You know, I could do it every day. It's a really great uh, pleasure. Well, so uh, uh, much love to your family, to your apparently expanding family, uh, one you. grandchild at a time. <laughs> and uh, Kim, uh, any questions before I excuse the witness? Uh, you're muted, but uh, I imagine you. I was going to say my husband's going to be really excited when I tell him I met a Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing how those guys get into people's hearts, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's yeah. true. Oh, God, you know, so I was the funny. only Klingon that never had to talk Klingonese. Thank God. Yeah, but yeah, that's a whole other... And the people who actually speak Klingon would have busted you if you just tried to fake it. So you're, Oh, you're I know. Really they're avid. They're, they know it. They've learned the whole little book. It's just wild. Um, all right, John, lots of love. Love to your wife, Harrison, who herself right is a remarkable uh, artist. And as we and say here in the South... I'll come back real soon now. <laughs> Bye, John Chuck. Bye. The Mark Thompson Show. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.